Hello, and welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Karen Snape with Virginia Cooperative Extension. This is the third entry in my series on invasive plants. And again, we're going to be learning about three plants that are not native to our area, but that have become introduced, established, and problematic. So I'm here at my mom's in Pennsylvania to tell you about Vinca. Vinca is a ground cover that was introduced in the 1700s from Europe. It's also native to North Africa and the Mediterranean. You often find Vinca growing near old home sites, old barns and habitations, and especially near old cemeteries. It was very popularly planted around cemeteries because it's evergreen and provides beauty and a feeling of eternal life. And so people planted it around cemeteries. A lot of those areas have now overgrown and become woodland. But when I'm in the woods and I see Vinca, I always start looking immediately for building foundations and especially for grave sites. Vinca is a trailing vine, not a climber, but a vine that sprawls along the ground. It's evergreen, and like most evergreens, the leaves are somewhat thick, and um, you can tell that they're kind of weather resistant, something that's going to persist through the winter. Um, these are Vinca minor leaves. Um, they're elliptical in shape. Vinca major is um, larger, wider at the base, more of a triangle or even heart shape. Um, Vinca is dark green with a lighter green or even white line down the center and is available in variegated varieties. Vinca leaves are opposite of each other, not alternate. And it may be confused with native wintergreen or partridge berry. So those are some things to look out for. Vinca is also called periwinkle and produces these five petaled light blue to purple blossoms. They very rarely set seed and often when they do, that seed is sterile. Vinca is a trailing vine, not a climbing vine, and it grows along the ground. It can spread unchecked to cover large areas with a thick mat of, of foliage and vines that nothing else can grow through but it's easily contained in a landscape setting simply by mowing along the edge of it. This vinca has been here for over 40 years, but when left unchecked, such as on an abandoned property, property or in an abandoned cemetery, it can grow fairly rapidly to take over large areas and crowd out native vegetation and create a monoculture that can become acres in size. In addition to mowing, vinca can be controlled by raking and pulling and removing manually, although it's going to come back and so that's going to be sort of a constant um, maintenance that's going to have to be done to keep it in check. Vinca can also be controlled with the use of either triclopyr or glyphosate products, um, either applied to freshly cut and mown or weed whacked areas or to fresh regrowth of those areas. We're looking at this very um, large colony of English ivy here at Wildwood Park, where I film a lot of my invasive species segments. The tree uh, is growing on an ailanthus tree, so another invasive species. And you can see that it's growing all the way to the very top of this tree. So there's not much tree that hasn't been infested with English ivy here. Almost the entire tree is covered with the ivy. English ivy, as the name implies, is native to England and also to Europe, as far west as into Asia and down into North Africa. And it was brought here in the early 1700s by European colonists. In addition to climbing up trees, English ivy grows along the ground, forming a thick ground cover that can prevent other things from growing. So English ivy leaves are typically have a heart-shaped base. This one is rather spear-shaped, but it is also very normal for them to have um, three lobes like these ones, or even five lobes. They can be quite variable. They can even get to the point where they're really just sort of oval-shaped. But this sort of three-lobed or heart-shaped 
appearance is probably most typical. You can also see that they are a dark glossy green with lighter colored or even white leaf veins. They're thick and kind of leathery feeling, which is something pretty typical for evergreens. That's a waxy cuticle or a waxy coating um, on the leaves that helps them to maintain their moisture content in the winter. The larger English ivy vines can be covered with these um, hairy looking rootlets, kind of like the poison ivy. The smaller ones are going to have fewer of these, but one of the things that the little rootlets do is that they um, secrete a sort of gluey substance and kind of cement themselves to the tree, which can make them kind of a little bit hard to get off sometimes. Once it reaches a few feet in height, English ivy will produce these yellow or green blooms in a starburst pattern. These later ripen into a dark blue-black fruit, which is dispersed by birds. English ivy tends to form very thick mats of foliage. So on the trunk of a tree like this, that can trap moisture, um, encouraging fungal growth and being unhealthy for the tree. And where it grows up into the limbs and smaller branches, it can put weight on those branches that the tree is not um, prepared for and cause damage in wind storms and ice storms. And it can also then shade out the leaves of its host tree. So that its host tree's leaves are covered with the leaves of the ivy and don't get the sun that they need in negatively impacting the health and vigor of the host tree. The leaves of English ivy can also be a carrier for bacterial leaf scorch. Now, both the leaves and the fruits of the English ivy um, contain a chemical called glycoside, which is toxic to people. Um, causes stomach upset in small doses, but can lead to much more serious complications. And the sap can cause a skin irritation on some people, uh, much like poison ivy rash. Um, I know that I don't have a problem with English ivy, so in the next few videos you'll see me doing some control with my bare hands. But if that's a, control, a concern for you, if you're not sure of your vulnerability to that, you're going to want to wear gloves. To control English ivy, the first thing you want to do is remove as much of it as possible. Some of the smaller vines are going to be very easy to remove. They'll come right off of the tree very easily. But larger vines may require you to cut them off. Um, as close to the base as possible is good. And again, you can usually get a good enough grip to pull off at least a little bit so that it doesn't uh, graft back together again. Sometimes the vines are going to be stuck so tight to the tree with those cementing roots that you can't get your clippers under them. Oh, in this case, I'm able to pry it up. But if you can't, you can use a, a screwdriver to get in there underneath and try to pry it away from the tree until you can get either break it off or get your clippers in underneath it and, and clip it off. And it does, you know, tend to come off pretty easily for at least a short distance. And then these pieces that are left behind on the tree will eventually die because they are no longer connected to the ground. Ivy does not take any nutrients from the tree. It's not parasitic. It needs to be connected to the ground in order to live. So these pieces will eventually die and fall out of the tree. But you want to get as much of it off as you can manually before you try any um, chemical control. Just because no one means of control is really going to be super effective against ivy. Um, without multiple uh, applications and, um, you know, probably years of maintenance. So um, start with removing what you can um, 
either put that in a bag and take it to a dump or put it someplace where it's going to dry out and you're going to be sure that none of these um, little roots are able to take hold someplace else. Where it grows um, along the ground, it can also be pretty easy to pull up in fairly large pieces. And there are actually instructions online for how you can cut it into chunks and roll it up like carpet. So you might consider something like that to get rid of as much of it as you can. Now, as an alternative to manual control, or preferably in addition to manual control, you can use herbicides to control English ivy. Uh, there's some evidence that a glyphosate product is going to be more effective than a triclopyr product. Again, unusual for woody species, but um, those products are going to be most effective on the young leaves. So you're thinking about spraying in early spring when the first new leaves come out in the year, or spraying following um, pulling and removal or, or mowing or cutting when new, new, a flush of new leaves comes out. Now because English ivy is evergreen, you have the option of using those chemicals in the winter when they're less likely to affect non-target species, other plants that are desirable, but you want to make sure you use them on a warm day, 60 degrees or more, in order for them to be effective. And watch um, carefully your your dosage. Um, make sure that you're following those label recommendations. You're going to probably have to go more towards what the maximum is for your product. Um, a lot of species you can get away with like you know cutting it back a little bit but probably not with the English ivy and you want to make sure you've got a preparation with a good surfactant. A uh, surfactant is a, um, a soap like chemical that's added to herbicides. It doesn't kill the plant itself, but it helps to make the plant absorb the chemical. And with this waxy coating on these leaves, that's going to be really important that you have a good surfactant in your mix. There are many species of privet native everywhere from Japan across to England and down into North Africa. However, the privet that causes the most problems and is most invasive here in the southeastern U.S. is Chinese privet. Privets in general have been introduced to the U.S. starting in the 1700s for use in gardens and hedgerows and ornamental purposes. The Chinese privet has probably been here since about 1950. Privet forms dense clusters and hedgerows. And I walk past this one on a regular basis and I've seen birds using this area for shelter, but very few other plants can grow. Really, we only see other invasive species here like Bradford pear and the honeysuckles. You can also see here the semi-evergreen state of the privet where it may lose most of its leaves, but not all of them, or it may lose them very late. It's already the middle of November here and you can see that the privet still has many of its leaves and those leaves are still green. Like most of the invasive species we've learned about, privet leaves grow opposite of each other on the stem. The leaves are oval shaped, not very big, and entire. There are no serrations or lobes to them and they have a blunt tip on the end. Leaves are glossy and dark green on the top. The undersides are a lighter green and sometimes have a little bit of fuzz along the midrib, that main vein on the back of the leaf. The berries of privet are also toxic to humans and they're born in these loose clusters, kind of pyramid shaped clusters, turning black in the fall and remaining on the bush through winter. Throughout the summer they are green, born where the white fragrant flowers were in the April to June time frame. The bark of the privet is light brown and it can verge on sort of a grayish tan or even a greenish brown with these lighter colored raised bumps called lenticels. One group of native species that you might confuse for privet are the viburnums. Viburnums are very diverse and they are also opposite leaved. However, most of them are serrated and or they have a rough textured blocky bark. 
In a maintained garden setting, privet can be pruned before it sets seed to prevent it from spreading into natural areas. However, to eliminate it from unwanted areas is going to require either extensive work to excavate the root system or the use of herbicides such as glyphosate, triclopyr, or amazapyr. Privet is also susceptible to browsing by goats. And you know, Achilles ivy too. But that's all I've got for you today. So have a safe and healthy Thanksgiving and meet us back here for another 15 minutes in the forest on December 4th when Bill Worrell will tell us about holiday greenery.